One of the reasons that the model's actually in, in the Royal Academy is there is a particular gallery which is set aside for architecture. In a sense, it's trying not to divorce architecture too much from the arts. Most of the exhibits here are actually demonstrating approaches to, towards various design problems and their solutions, but also the mediums within which architects are now, now working. It's very rare in the, in the City of London that we get to see so much of, of a site and we can actually work out um, street plans, Roman street plans, medieval street patterns, that sort of information by, by being able to look at such a large area. These are the hawks we typically use for this type of work. They're called Harris hawks. They put up with uh, cars, traffic people. We find these are the best birds for this type of work. Well, I think that this building is a very important piece of um, Victorian arts and crafts because you've got most types of decorative feature within this building. You have metalwork, you have paintings, you have woodwork, stonework, and the whole thing adds up to an extremely nice example of the sort of work that they produced, the craftsmanship that they produced at the turn of the century. Here we are outside the original Lloyd's Register building, completed in 1901, which was very much their original flagship building. Where there was a body of original work, we would reinstate it to its original condition. So one of our primary aims was to be able to actually integrate this building and to bring it back to some of its historic former glory. As you can see, not one of the ple most pleasant experiences being on the road at this side but then one could actually enter through this new arch and we could find somewhere which was more peaceful. By creating this one kind of almost Alice in Wonderland arch, you can actually enter into a completely quiet, slightly more exotic world. We've had some, some wonderful artefacts from the site um, from, from all sorts of different periods. We've had from the, from the later sort of post-medieval 16th, 17th centuries some almost complete um, glass bottles um, and some, some wonderful pieces of medieval ceramics. We've also had um, all sorts of Roman finds from Roman pottery with, with the maker's stamp on it. We've also had Roman flutiles um, which would have been used in the, the sort of Roman central heating systems. Well, this site and all of the sites in, in the city that, that, are, that are going on at the moment, they, they, they are adding to, to our knowledge of, of the development of Roman London and medieval London. And it, it is very much an ongoing process and one that will, will continue. And this, this site will add more information. Other sites will later on. Restrictions we had on the site was basically Lloyds Avenue, which is a conservation area where we have to maintain an existing facade and we also have to maintain Lloyd Register's building, number 71, which is a grade, a grade two star listed building. Originally, we had actually had the higher block here. The whole building stepping sequence changed completely, so it flipped over, so that essentially from the conservation area, we had a series of buildings which begin to step up away from that. We also have a churchyard, which we cannot actually touch. I mean, Lloyd's have a, something like a thousand year lease on it. We're not allowed to build on it. Um, so the issue was really how does one begin to integrate this space um, as part and frontispiece to, to the main building. These two listed trees 
also were something that begins to actually provide this kind of breathing space, this softness to the space. I think the other complex problem we had was how did we define a barrier or a relationship of a new high technology building to the rear facade of some grade two Edwardian Baroque building. All of this at that time was the backs of existing buildings, very much not parts of buildings that were ever designed to be seen. I think the view from here will be absolutely stunning. I think it will be what a fantastic space in London. There's a very simple stair, very simple canopy, which begins to actually draw you into the main reception area. When we take the bird onto a new site, um, basically we're just trying to convince the local pigeons or starlings that are a nuisance um, that the hawk has now moved into the area and he's going to be living here on a uh, fairly permanent basis. At Fenchurch Street there's a lot of scaffolding and a lot of building work so as the builders tend to move off and go home the pigeons were tending to come in and roost in amongst the scaffolding and on the uh, the suitable ledges. Um, basically we, we, we come in as the builders go home, we fly the birds around just to keep the pigeons from getting a nice foothold and becoming comfortable again. When we initially start a new job we'd, we'd visit the site on a daily basis over a period of two weeks usually. Um, we'd fly between one and two birds um, depending on the extent of the problem. Once the hawk territory as such is established and the, uh, the resident pigeons have moved on and we feel we have the area pretty much under control, we'd continue to maintain this territory on a once weekly basis. This is a white model and as probably Lloyds are beginning to become aware, it's actually a very brightly coloured building. <laughs> the steel holding the thing up is actually blue. The secondary for the staircases is in yellow. The actual mechanical vertical moving systems are red. They're very much using colour in a semi-literate way rather than something which is just purely decorative or applied. When we clean, because we're only removing sort of superficial surface dirt, it's very easy to forget what level you're cleaning to. So to remind ourselves, we leave a little square of uncleaned paint surface. Unfortunately, um, some areas of gilding have been damaged and um, some areas have been painted, repainted with gold paint, which does not look quite right. So there will be, have to be a certain amount of re-gilding. We were aware that um, this building was given a, a very large refurb refurbishment in the late 60s. They had covered the whole thing with a tinted varnish. So our job was to remove or to lessen the effect of this very uneven and very dark varnish and also to clean as far as possible, any, remove any remaining dirt. We would only infill in areas or in paint in areas where we knew exactly what had to be replaced. It is this notion of a journey. We define what we're looking for, and that will inevitably bring up problems. I mean, buildings are about problem solving. 
It is one of the most complicated sites, certainly, that we've, we've worked on. We've got a ride the buildings, we don't have street, we have limited street frontage, we've got the existing 71 reefer, which is a grade two star listed building. We had to retain the facade of Coronation House, uh, and it's reconciliation of all of those issues into a design which reads at the end of the day as a cohesive product, which marries in the existing listed building, which marries in the facade, sets off the springing point from new to old and vice versa. This whole area was just a clutter of Victorian buildings. And on that site, Lloyds were looking to put a modern, you know, state-of-the-art building to, to house something like 260,000 square feet. You're in this Houdini-like environment where you're trapped in this box and it's like, well, now get out of that. We were constructing two levels underground um, adjacent you know, neighbouring buildings, so the complexities of that had to be taken into account and managed. I think it's probably the most complex design problem our office has ever had to deal with, actually. The proposal was to um, have a fan-shaped geometry, which is really dictated by the orientation of Lloyds Avenue um, and fan-shaped plates, because they're not parallel to each other, and then the floor plates basically fan from one axis to the other. So our building is basically responding to two site boundaries. The reason it fans is to occupy as much of the site as possible. Because of the constraints of the site, they've actually developed a precast concrete frame. I mean, the quality is absolutely stunning. The way the design to the cores and the structure has been developed with the contractors and the subcontractors, the whole issue was to begin to systemize elements which could be fabricated off-site brought together, bolted together, and lifted and put in place. I mean, that also take, that takes out um, a lot of time from the site where you're not actually putting bricks one on top of each other. It's always good to actually draw on board uh, manufacturers' knowledge because they're actually better at these things. They're far more up to date than we are. tapered shape to each of the moulds has meant that uh, each mould is purpose-built. The accuracy level that's required is to the millimetre. Each angle is cut and mitred to within 30 minutes or half a degree to achieve the correct alignment for all of the casting components. Visually, people see light from the floors below coming up through the lenses. The overall appearance will be striking. Certainly, they're quite unique in the way that they look. We'll be able to see the shadow from people walking beneath. We're extremely proud of the workmanship that we've achieved with very high standard of finish that, uh, when installed in the building, people will look at and it'll be admired. So there was a whole process of benchmarks, prototyping, um, looking at it, making comments, and really developing with the specialists, with the subcontractors, because at the end of the day, they're the people who are going to build the thing to the quality and specification that you, you put down on paper. And working with them, I have to say, it was on this project and other projects, is a great pleasure. You're actually talking to people who actually make these things, and, and th that's one of the buzzes uh, that I certainly get out of there. Today is about bringing together the old and the new. As one of the city's older institutions, Lloyd's Register has existed in three separate centuries, and the new complex will take us into our fourth century of existence. And this development blends perfectly with our long and established heritage with our high technology-based operations. I would like to offer my warmest congratulations to everyone who has been involved in this project. You may have your noggin of ale with great pleasure. In terms of the actual sequence of stepping, you, you can begin to see that we've created a series of splayed atria 
which basically are allowing light to penetrate as much as possible into the core of the building. And you can see here the atrium roof. This is very much the thermal envelope of the building. This is a graphic representation of a, of a completely moving wall. All of this is basically activated by solar cells on the roof. And each of these louver screens will actually close down when the sun is incident on it. As the sun moves around, these facades open up and this facade begins to close down so it responds to sunlight during the, uh, during the day. This is very much from here, the springing point for the new building. And from there, we have different environmental control systems. We've got chilled ceilings. In the historic part, we have chilled beams in the new section. This is, as you can see at the moment, is actually a naturally ventilated space that allows air to be brought into the lower area. And then there are also opening windows at high level, which allows the air out to outside from high level. This concrete is attempting to reach a similar temperature. It's trying to even out all temperatures. And because it's much cooler, has a dense thermal mass, it will absorb probably one to one and a half degrees of heat energy from the building during the working day. At night, it cools down. And then the next day, it will absorb more heat. It just takes off extra energy requirements for the cooling system. The chill beam itself, air is actually supplied under the floor. As the air actually heats from computer screens and people and from energy from the sun, that air rises as it becomes warmer and actually then collects. The heat collects in the vault and then that air settles onto the chilled beam, which is like a series of, it's like a car radiator where there's chilled water pipes which run within that. It uses less energy to run. I think the theoretical predictions were that this building would probably have 30% savings to an equivalent air, fully air-conditioned office building in the city, which is quite substantial if Lloyds are going to be here for another 100 years. had a huge amount of interest from, from staff at Lloyd's Register in, in what's going on on the site. If there's a space within Lloyd's, I'm sure it would be possible to have um, some, some of the nice find displayed because, after all, it was underneath their building in the, in the first place. This is a prototype. You know, we, we did not want to create this big hidden citadel where people worked. We needed something that would be able to actually communicate to a wider public realm. We needed to use it to create at least a dialogue between those two worlds. We've had Lloyd's Register, who have been totally supportive throughout the project, um, always open to suggestions, always open with presentations and dialogue with them, and as presenting the logic of our proposals to them and them understanding it and giving us support to, to follow it through. So that's been an exciting part of the project. The only things that you have are actually is, is that notion of what is the spirit of what it is we're trying to achieve. And that is always very, very simple, very, very basic. I always get a buzz out of um, um, walking through the building of actually looking at the components, touching it, because these are things which uh, we've wrestled with, we've drawn, we've sketched, we've modelled, um, we've broken the models, ripped up the sketches. So all, all of those issues um, become quite personal. And I think one of the greatest buzz of being an architect is actually walking through a building that you've work, worked on for four or five years. So, I mean, we, we're sitting outside today uh, on, a, on a nice sort of breezy day, the doors whizzing around and just to see the lifts and the lobbies and the churchyard animated by people, I mean, that's, that's a great plus for me.